Hey folks, today we're having a look at energy in the UK. So we just pop that down as our title. Energy in the UK is the first part of section C in paper two. It's the section that everybody needs to answer. So regardless of whether you're doing global food, water or energy, globally, everybody does energy in the UK. Now when we're thinking about energy, it's important to remember that we're thinking about heating, so heating our homes, and that's often, you know, gas, gas boilers and so on. We are thinking about electricity, so the power source that powers all of our things in our homes and some people's cars these days. So electricity. And then the other type of energy that we often think about is how we, how most vehicles still are powered and that's petrol and diesel. Now, in the UK, we have an energy mix that is changing all the time. Now, as of today, and you can date it by the video, um, you will see that we have to import 75% of our electricity and our energy needs. So just draw a very simple circle. I know it's not always easy, but it doesn't have to be perfect. Um, now, 75%, so just gonna shade in this side, 75% as of today uh, is the amount of our energy that is imported from abroad. So I'm just gonna put that up there. Now that's quite a shocking statistic. It does mean that the UK is energy insecure it means we cannot produce enough electricity for our population. So 75% of our energy, that's across the board, is imported. And imported means that it's bought in from other countries. Now, to give you a clue, so obviously we produce 25% of our energy. The rest of it comes from places like we get oil, or petrol, so you could draw like a little barrel of oil, um, and that's obviously quite black as well by nature. Um, that comes from OPEC, which you might have learnt about when looking at Nigeria, so that's the Organisation of Petrol Exporting Countries, so that's like a group of countries, as well as Russia, we buy oil from, uh, and Sweden. So those are kind of our top three places we buy it from. Then we've got, we're still buying some coal, although much less than we used to. And coal we get from uh, Russia again is one of our main places we have import from. Russia and Colombia. So quite far away, not terribly local for coal. And then there's one more thing which is natural gas. I didn't draw the coal, did I? I'm just going to draw that. There we go. It's quite black, isn't it? There we go. Um, and gas. Okay, from um, Norway. So that is quite a close neighbour. I believe that's piped in. But again, won't surprise you, from Norway, Russia, and Qatar. So quite a distance. There we go. So those are, are fossil fuels that we import, and that, that makes up about 75% of our imports, our electricity imports, not energy imports. Okay, the UK has move forward with some things. We're, we're working with renewables more, we've increased our production of natural gas, and we've reduced our input, sort of our, our reliance on coal and oil. So over on this side, if we're just going to put in a little table, again, it, don't worry if it's not straight lines, mine always aren't. Uh, we'll just put the UK at the top. And then things that have gone down, so things we've reduced our dependence on. And then on the other side, if we have things that we have increased our use of. Remember, all this 
makes up what is quite a dynamic energy mix. So it depends very much on the day, on the hour, um, what the UK is using in terms of fuels. But we know for definite that coal has reduced. We used to have lots of coal mines in the country. And, you know, not that many years ago, lots of people would go to work in them all over the country. And we have clo had to close down quite a lot of them. And there is actually, um, there is a target for 2025, so a couple of years time, um, for the closure of all of them. So all the final ones will be closed down. All coal fired power stations. So you can see already how this is going to change. You know, those, that coal that we're importing from Russia, well in the future, if we don't have any coal fired power stations, we're not going to be able to use that to create electricity. So yeah, it's interesting. We've got that first one of coal. And then the second one is oil. So another fossil fuel that we're reducing our dependence on. I'm just going to draw some black droplets of oil. And basically oil is just not viable anymore. It's too expensive on a large scale. It used to be, cost benefit analysis used to be quite good. Nowadays it's not. So it is not viable. That's the word you want to use. It's not viable anymore. It's too expensive to use on a large scale. That does not mean that it will be stopped altogether. There will be still some places that probably are still using it. Let's just draw the line across there. Right, now what has increased? A bit of a mixture really. The first one is natural gas. This has gone up quite a lot with the discovery of more natural gas in our country, in our countries, I should say, in the UK. Um, so natural gas has increased and actually two thirds of our supply is still underground. And that means there's more that they can harvest and use to help with our energy needs. And the other one which I'm really pleased about, this makes me very happy, is renewables. I often tell my students in the classroom, when I started teaching 14 years ago now, um, renewables were, I think, about 5% of our um, electricity needs. So really not very much at all. And nowadays, they we get 42%. That's as of today, or yesterday when I was researching this. 42% um, of our energy needs is powered from renewables and particularly this is where it gets interesting wind power um, which I absolutely love I think it's brilliant we get 26% from solar which is obviously the sun is much less might not surprise you in the UK uh, 2% but we we haven't actually got amazing infrastructure for that, whereas we've got lots and lots of wind farms popping up. Um, something called biomass, which um, is where you der derive energy from gases pulled from things like anything really, uh, but potatoes, crops, things that haven't sold, they can just sit them in a big round drum and then they can extract the gases from them, basically rotting and things, and then use that to to burn and, and to power things. So there's biomass and then the other one is hydro. So hydroelectricity is 2%. So you can see quite clearly just from that that we have a lot more um, electricity coming from renewables than we ever have done. Now the important thing to state, I'll pop this over here, um, and this is kind of a negative, is that electricity demand is higher than ever. The population, although it's rising slowly, it is still rising. And 
people are charging things and wanting more and more electricity. Okay, so that's a bit of a negative. Um, however, this is going to sound confusing, but go with it. Energy consumption, so this is, remember, this isn't just electricity, so heating, um, fuel for transport and industry. Energy consumption is actually falling uh, due to something called deindustrialization. Now, this is a word we do come across in geography, and it's an important one. So industrialization is the process of a place becoming industrialized and having factories and producing things. Deindustrialization is the opposite, it's where the factories are no longer required and that heavy industry is not using so much energy. And that's because in the in this country we are moving towards a tertiary economy um, where we're not making things. Um, instead we're selling things or we're in research or science. Um, now, the thing that leaves us with, unfortunately, is the fact that the UK is, as I mentioned earlier, is energy insecure. And that means we're actually in something called energy deficit which is where we do not have enough energy to supply, uh, or just, just enough energy that balances out the supply. Okay, now moving on, um, there are three types of energy that I want to include in this that we're really looking at in the UK, um, and there's a couple that I guess are quite important. So the first one, you probably want to know about this one too, is wind power. So if you can, draw a very uh, simple kind of wind turbine with its blades. They almost all have three blades. Um, and if we just write wind power. Now, I teach on a, at a school on the south coast and our closest um, wind farm is something called Rampion, Rampion Wind Farm, which is just off the coast of Brighton. But there is also one called Anglia One, which is off the east coast, and that's the largest one in the UK. Right, next up, we are going to make a little pros and cons table for this, because there are pros and cons to both. So pros and cons. Now the good thing about wind power is it is cheap to run. So once it's up and running, and it's um, in place, it's incredibly cheap to run. They, you can replace the blades, you can service the machines, but it's really low cost. It also has very low carbon emissions. So it's a very, very clean energy to use. And the best one, and I know this myself because I absolutely love it when it's windy and I love going uh, windsurfing, is the UK is windy. We can have patches with no wind, but generally speaking, we are an island nation. We get lots of wind. Now, for the cons, as I said before, it is expensive to build and kind of set up. Very expensive. But once it's in place, it's a lot cheaper. The other thing is they can be quite noisy and basically kind of affect nature so and wildlife and that's in the construction process, but also with the turbines and birds. So impact wildlife. And the last one, a bit of a strange one, but some people think that they're an eyesore. Okay, so some people find them unesthetically pleasing. Some people find them unattractive. Okay, unattractive. Too many ends there. There we go. Right, the next one I want to discuss with you is fracking. Now, fracking is a really controversial. 
it also has a high carbon footprint, not just in the production of fracking, but also in its extraction. So it's not good for the environment and not a sensible way to move forward. Um, but also there's a very serious social impact of earthquakes, which obviously can damage people's homes and property. And then there's these toxic chemicals, which they've found to leach into water supplies, contaminating drinking water. They've even had people setting fire to methane that's coming out of their taps. So all in all, not a good thing. Then, finally, the other one I want to focus on is nuclear energy. And to do that, I'm going to draw a circle. Again, it does not have to be perfect, uh, with a small circle in the middle. And then, obviously this would be better in yellow, but that's okay. So nuclear energy is brilliant in so many ways. It's really incredibly efficient. And France are huge um, supporters of it. In fact, something like 95% of their energy needs come from nuclear. It's um, done well, it's absolutely brilliant. So nuclear energy. Now you can Google and just find out where they all are. There's lots and lots of them. But my class is a case study, we look at Hinkley. Now we're just gonna do a little pros and cons table for this one, just to finish off. And we'll look at the advantages and the disadvantages of nuclear power. So as I already mentioned, it is incredibly efficient. So you don't need lots and lots of raw materials, you don't have to rely on the wind, you don't need to be breaking rock like with fracking to extract small amounts of gas. It's efficient, it's incredibly reliable, it's cost effective, so I say it's cost effective, it's very expensive to set up, but once it's running it's very cost effective. Um, and it's just all in all quite clean as well. I'm not as clean as full on renewables like wind power, but it doesn't produce a lot of um, waste, which is brilliant. Now, the cons are very simple. It's incredibly expensive. So much so that we've even had to outsource the production costs to other countries like China. Um, it's difficult to sort out when, it's, when you're done with it. So to decommission, that's called it's not easy at all. Nuclear waste is the most hazardous substance, so very big um, challenge to decommission. And there is always a risk, okay, a risk of radiation leaks, which obviously would put people at harm's way. So yeah, it's got lots of positives for it, but there are some negatives too. There you go, that's energy in the UK.